This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hello, this is Justin Beyer for Software Engineering Radio, and today I'm speaking with Haroon Willemsen and Sven Schleier. Haroon is a principal security architect at Zebia with a passion for mobile security and risk management. He has supported companies as a security coach, an architect, a security engineer, and as a full-stack developer. Sven is an application security expert with hands-on experience in web and mobile penetration testing and is a principal application security consultant living in Singapore. He is also the creator of the OWASP Mobile Hacking Playground. Both Sven and Haroon are project leads for the OWASP Mobile Security Testing Guide and Mobile Application Security Verification Standard. So just to start off the episode, I want to talk a little bit about mobile application development and then work into the security discussion. So back in episode 300, we discussed um, mobile app development with Jonathan Stark, and I'd refer listeners there for a more in-depth discussion. But just to start off, what kind of mobile applications can be developed? I know that there's native apps and web apps and hybrid apps and progressive web apps, sometimes called PWAs. You know, what are those and how do they differ from a security perspective from one another? So if I can have a little jump on that one, if we look at mobile apps and I don't think I'll have to go very deep detail, but it's nice to have a small trip down memory lane, I guess. In the very old days, uh, we didn't do mobile native apps at all, of course. We just had a website that was loaded into a browser on a device and we tried to tailor that towards a mobile perspective. So you basically have all the oddities of a browser stack, all the issues you normally have, and you're actually visiting a mobile website. So that's just uh, where we started off. Then basically, um, the whole jump into native apps came, but they became too compl- complicated. So in a native app, you basically don't have their browser stack anymore, but you're trying to run directly into the runtime of the operating system. And then the hybrid app came where we said, okay, let's try to use, for instance, the web view and render as much as we can over there. So we still have the same mobile website feeling. But at the other hand, let's try to use those native things as well. Um, for instance, try to uh, work with the fingerprint uh, scan, uh, scanner in a later point in time. But at first, of course, like stuff like GPS to start to know where you are and all those type of features, let's combine them. We had a very long time a promise of the performance that it would be better than a mobile website and it would be easier than a native app. But what we ended up with for a lot of years was basically a very slow application that had all the vulnerabilities of a web view and all the vulnerabilities of wrong implementations of those plugins. So security-wise, we still weren't there. But at the other end, otherwise you had to run to the complicated native app. Then, of course, you have progressive web apps where you have web service workers downloading the content a priori and making sure it would still work. And then you go back to how well is your browser stack defined? How well did you secure it over there? And you start over that party again. So overall, if we have to rate that, I think still, depending on how well you wield your tools, I think a native app can be the most secure. But that does mean you have to stick by the book and you'd end up with two different code bases or a framework that is tailored towards having native compilation. So you start with something like Xamarin. Yes, you start with Xamarin, for instance, and all they do is compile towards the the native app SDK. You don't do anything else. And in the end, you do They need to do some tailoring from time to time, depending on the version and how well it was uh, developed over time. But at least you get all the security features you need. But then again, when it comes to adding anti-reverse engineering and other tooling, you again have to jump into the native code base. So overall, native is indeed easier to secure, I would say, but it comes with a price. You as a developer have to work pretty much harder to get all that extra out of it. And it's really a question if you need that. I mean, overall, if you have a marketing app, you want to get it out yesterday. But if you want to secure your banking, that's a bit of a different game altogether. Yeah, and that's definitely something we'll dive into a little bit more when we discuss, you know, threat modeling and picking where you actually need to be on the, you know, security spectrum of things. But that's definitely an interesting way to put it. So essentially, when you look at something like Xamarin, you know, you might get some of those higher level security benefits with some of the ease of use of having, you know, one single code base that I can compile across the whole, you know, landscape of devices that Microsoft wants to support for it. Whereas a native app, you know, I might have five different development teams because I need to develop an app for iOS, an app for Android, and then, you know, the 500 other kinds of Android that, you know, are running on T-Mobile versus, you know, Verizon versus whomever's uh, custom version of their kernel. So essentially what you're saying is, you know, 
when I'm running a high security app or something where I need to implement things like anti reverse engineering or more secure network protocols and have that lower level hook in, I need to look at a native app versus these other kinds of apps. Yes, definitely, definitely. So if it comes to the higher level stuff, like securing the network, we got a browser stack that's uh, nowadays pretty much okay if you got support for certificate transparency and other stuff to do a lot of basic vetting. But the moment you are afraid that specific attacks might happen where a lot of additional headers are stripped off, for instance, yeah, then you have to up your game. But it's really, again, your threat model. If you think your users are only at home and they have a separate VPN where the communications happen across or something, you then have the network stack. It's not really that important at all. But if you look at the current state of things like with COVID-19, many people have to stay home anyway. So that's a whole different network security game altogether. But if you now look, for instance, at before COVID-19, where people in different countries used to hang out in pubs and, you know, oh, I forgot that your friend is telling that he did this and this and now you still oh you had to pay that so you now have to go online and quickly because your mobile banking told you it was this easy so you want to go there then all of a sudden you're on the insecure shared wi-fi because you forgot that you should have turned on 3g instead of your you know wi-fi and then we get end up with a whole different security frame in terms of the network stack that you're running on and then all of a sudden pinning and all the other jazz becomes important okay so again it it's a mix of both, you know, from my app, what am I doing in my app and how secure do I need to make it for my users by default without forcing my user to think about it and go, oh, I was on the shared Wi-Fi. Hold on. Let me get on the LTE because that might be a little bit more secure, or at least in my head, it might be a little more secure. Exactly. So moving a little bit off of just the discussion of mobile apps and what kinds there are, you know, just to make an easy comparison, most developers, I would argue, are doing something with web apps of some kind today. And most developer education is focused towards, you know, building the next SaaS app and all those things. So how would you say that a web application differs from, you know, mobile applications on a security perspective? You know, what are the different areas of concern that I'm going to have for a mobile app versus a web app? Uh, so just just a few things. I mean, during a web application test that you would do from a from an attacker's point of view, so the, the, the major things that are really different is the amount of data that is actually stored in a mobile app. So when you look at web apps, of course, there's also a lot of data stored, but it's just getting more and more in terms of uh, mobile apps that is being stored. I mean, we have heaps of, of gigabytes nowadays available, and the mobile apps make also extensive use of that, meaning a lot of data is actually there. And it's, of course, also very easy in order to store this information securely with iOS and Android if you make a native app. But still, there's a lot more information that is actually stored in mobile apps. The other thing that Jeroen was already mentioning is then the reverse engineering factor also. So especially a lot of um, apps, if you think now about OTP apps or also about um, banking apps, uh, especially gaming apps, they have a huge attack vector of reverse engineering because a lot of the logic is also within the game, also within OTP apps. And if you find then the actual algorithm that you that you can break that, that that you need to break, and that um, allows you then to reverse engineer the actual process, and for example, generate your own OTPs. If we stick with the OTP example, or you might be able to cheat in games then you will have a big attack vector and that might actually really have an impact of the companies, especially in games. So reverse engineering is definitely one of the big impacts that you have for mobile apps compared to um, compared to web apps. Yeah, and I'm assuming that, you know, unlike games on your computer, you can't have an anti-cheat engine that's running from, you know, boot if we look at, you know, some of the newer anti-cheat engines. Whereas, you know, on a mobile device, we're actually talking about we're going to have to implement something to obfuscate the code in such a way that, you know, I'm going to prevent against reverse engineering. But just changing directions a little bit, local storage is definitely something that's unique to mobile versus web. So how do you protect that, you know, in your app against someone losing or getting their device stolen? You know, are you 100% reliant on the actual underlying operating system implementing some kind of protection via PIN or passcode? Or is there something you can do within your app to actually protect the data that you're storing in there? Like, let's say you're storing certificates for some reason or another in your local storage for your app. How would I protect those kinds of secrets within it? There's uh, an MCG. We have the, uh, a nice uh, comparison in terms of security, which you can get basically. And 
what we always start off with is if you're not afraid of um, data being stolen in that sense, um, you can start off at least as close to the secure world as possible. So start with using stuff in uh, the keychain uh, or have a key in the in the Android key store with uh, strong box encryption. So start as strong as possible. But the moment you you might be afraid of something going wrong, then it's better to actually move that control after that away from uh, the mobile device, but move it towards the server. So with the app, you authenticate towards the server, you get your decryption key, and you can start decrypting the local content. And the moment your device is stolen, you just block your app instance, for instance, and then you're pretty sure nobody can access that data anymore. And then the more you go towards having keys or data stored, uh, something like share preferences or the secured part of the Android storage or the uh, less or more secured file system of iOS, the more you start opening yourself up to a lot of different attack factors, especially if there's no interaction with the server necessary anymore, because that means the moment the device got stolen and um, the passcode might be easy to guess or the device got obtained while being unlocked, for instance, and kept unlocked, um, then you got a whole different thing. But as you can already hear while I'm telling this, we all of a sudden started to Introducing different threat scenarios. So the moment you think like, okay, I'm only worried about a locked device being stolen, it's fine with just moving keys into the secure world and you know having your passcode to protect that. But it also immediately minimize sets a limit or a bar for your minimum iOS and Android version. Because prior to those, we didn't have hardware keys, so yeah, you can't service those anymore. At the other end, if you're afraid of a device being stolen or robbed because there's really a higher risk towards your app, yeah, then you need something else. But then you're always too late anyway. Um, but let's say you want to have a more of a hybrid model because you want to allow users to have their devices unlocked for hours, which is not really what we would recommend in the first place in terms of privacy, of course. But you know, people people are people and they want ease of access. So they want the simplest guessable passcode anyway, because I'm always forgetting my passcode and it's so hard and the light in my face is so heavy when I have to do face authentication. So let's do this differently, you know, those type of things. Then we have to start interacting with the server at least so that at least at some point in time when their easy to unlock device gets stolen, of which a lot of your users will have because you're not creating a complicated app for a complicated device user. You're creating an app for the masses. So you want to make sure you can also service that that boy or girl or women or uh, or men that doesn't want to go all the way in securing stuff. He just wants it to work because he never figured security. And why should he? Because his life has been secure enough till now until his device got stolen. And then if that's your threat model, then you should start thinking about let's Make sure you got the server in there in that handshake, that, that you got the key from the server. And yes, then the user has to authenticate. Yes, that's a hassle. But apparently you have something so much of high-risk data on that device right now, it's worth it. But if you combine these things the wrong way around, it gets hairy. So it really starts with actually having a proper threat model. And then the line starts, you know, similar like reverse engineering. You can start pick what you want there. Yeah, we had done an episode with Adam Showstack discussing uh, threat modeling. I don't think it's published yet as of the recording of this episode, but in discussing that, it almost makes me think of, you know, in some cases, an app for a general user, you may not necessarily be worried about the data that's stored on there. Let's say an email application. But once I go to a corporate environment, now I'm starting to worry about what kind of data sitting in it. And maybe this is less of a, you know, from a vendor perspective saying, yes, our app is 100% secure all the time, no matter the user, no matter the use case, we'll protect your data, whether it's you know, cat pictures or your, you know, million billion dollar, you know, intellectual property. And instead saying, look, we'll do our best. But if you want to implement these things, you need to look at something like a mobile device management solution where you can enforce these kinds of controls like face ID or, you know, having, you know, 15 digit pin codes that can't be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, and circling back again, you know that the enforcement necessarily doesn't live within the app, but is instead on the actual operating system side, almost like the discussion. And I guess this would be an interesting comparison to hear, you know, would you say that it's almost closer to how we used to worry about application development and security in that traditional, you know, client server architecture, when we used to stick a hard client on someone's desktop and say, you know, run this application, it'll connect to our server in the back end, and then it'll pop up on your machine. Versus the current model of, yeah, just open your web browser and go to the web page. It's available everywhere. Here you go. I think there's quite some similarities to it indeed, because in the end, 
you end up with uh, hopefully that client being secure enough to do something, whereas the web makes it more easier. But at the other end, if you go back to that old client, that client had a much more capabilities, which we don't have with the web in its current shape. Of course, the web is uh, changing all the time, so we might end up with no need for mobile native apps eventually, but we don't see that yet. So in that sense, there is indeed some of those things going on in there. But the difference is when we look between thin client and doing web first, so go from client server technology to a more of a different uh, a software as a service model, you can see that we already tried launching away from native apps to SaaS a bunch of times. And every time we start walking back. <laughs> so that's a bit of a different uh, journey. Whereas with the, you know, the SaaS journey, we go, well, let's say up, I don't know, left or right, but, you know, more towards the server again. And at the native, we had Cordova. We, I bet you Cordova exists for quite a while. We got quite a lot of different hybrid technologies as well. But for every one of those, you can see that they're used by some, but eventually we ended up with, again, more native apps. And now we have a lot more different frameworks that are being used, which have great results. I mean, if you look at some of those hybrid app technologies nowadays, they're pretty fast and it's looking beautiful. But again, we see also new native apps popping up next to them. So it's not like it's a journey that went off towards SaaS like we're used to. At the other end, to be fairly honest, if you look at managed workplaces, you see that the thing client is coming back again, but then purely in the cloud. So I don't think we really went away from the thin client model as well in the amount that we would like to believe ourselves. But from a consumer perspective, yes, we did. And we love it. I mean, check it out. Chrome, Firefox, Safari will bring you anywhere. But overall, for many different company environments, we end up using that same Chrome to connect to a remote uh, desktop web interface. And we start over with a thin client, just with a web interface on top of it. But we're back at the same thing again. So yeah, it's a journey. Yeah, I always like to think of the, uh, you know, Microsoft remote app, you know, I stick a remote app proxy in front of my on prem app, and now it's a SaaS app sort of kind of ish, maybe. Yes. So changing directions a little bit here. And, you know, kind of a silly question here. You know, we've mentioned it and kind of covered it, but I just want to make it really clear. When my app is interfacing with the API, I still need to worry about all those API security issues and, you know, all those authentication issues and the session management or, you know, cross-site scripting issues or, you know, local file, you know, inclusions. That's all still a problem, even if my mobile app is 100% secure, right? I mean, all of the different things that you were just mentioning, um, like cross-site scripting, for example, this is only an issue if you have a web view. So for all the different things that um, Hirun was already mentioning, like, for example, Xamarin or Cordova, whatever is WebView based, then things like cross-site scripting is definitely something you need to consider and you would need to take care also in your mobile app development. If it's not actually about the authentication and um, also authorization, all of these things, this is something that we do not really cover in the mobile security testing yet. I mean, we touch it definitely and we explain it also, but um, it's something that is more on the server side and on the client side, it's, it's very similar then to, to web apps, I would say. I mean, on top of that, you have the benefit of using things like local authentication we were already talking about, like where you have this additional step, like biometric authentication. But um, in that sense, it's shifting a little bit, especially with things like cross-site scripting also. There's always an added nastiness towards it, because the moment that you start uploading photos to an API from your native app, Who's guaranteeing that a native app is talking to your API? And the moment you start believing as a developer that, oh, it's only the mobile app and nobody knows about this. So apparently you did enter reverse engineering to kind of, you know, get that away. And all of a sudden, the JPEG starts to have very funny binary code in there. Uh, we're getting a bit into trouble now, aren't we? So in that sense, remote file inclusion still lives. I mean, you can't trust what a mobile app is uploading because you don't know what the mobile app is. Indeed, like... Uh, Sven was already mentioning that's not where the MSTG is designed for. Of course, we have a few controls in the MESVS and also quickly describe the MCG to remind you of the fact that you have to implement your security controls at the server, which automatically means that these kind of filtering need to apply over there as well. Uh, but we already have many funny cases uh, at different customers where people were so beautifully focused at the mobile app that they forgot that other agents can access their API as well, unfortunately. So having my slash mobile endpoint is in a uh, safe security mechanism to prevent 
you know, these security issues. And as you're mentioning, you know, this isn't something necessarily in scope for the mobile application security testing guide and, you know, that kind of stuff. And maybe this would be a more appropriate, you know, looking at in the OWASP realm, the web security testing guide to actually review those APIs and, you know, verify our authentication, all those kinds of security things, and then be able to say, okay, our API is secure. Now let's make it work with our mobile app. Yep, exactly. Awesome. So now just diving in a little bit here, what would you say would be common areas that developers when they're building their, you know, mobile apps should be focusing on from a security perspective? So where they should really focus on is starting always out with the threat model. Because the moment you start enumerating controls, it's endless. Of course, at the mobile application security verification standard, we have a level one and level two, and always start with level one with the hygiene uh, controls you require. Um, a great example is, for instance, if you look at network and storage, where we start with the basics. So don't, at the storage level, before we start talking about encrypting your storage and stuff, let's start with, okay, only store stuff that you really need to store and leave other stuff at the server. If you look at network, don't start pinning immediately. Let's just first try to have a decent certificate chain in place. Let's just first try to make sure you're using decent protocols and then we move ahead. So start with the basic hygiene and the MASVS can clearly guide you by the means of level what you should do first. And of course, if you have a proper threat model, you can always say no to certain level one controls because you believe that the risk of discovering is so little that you're okay with that. The funny but sad and consultancy answer is it depends unfortunately and really it starts with threat model first then take the hygiene controls that you're really sure of and then the ones you debated in your model and then if you still have a lot of risks left that you really need to cover start d jumping into the higher end controls so it really starts with basic input sanitization don't store stuff you don't need to store get your network security controls in place make sure that you did your authentication properly wherever necessary and that you thought about the authorization model altogether uh, let's make sure you have something like architecture documentation. And that sounds a bit weird. And I know as a, I did a lot of development work, we don't really like writing documentation that much, to be honest. I mean, many of us don't. But if you don't have a common understanding of what you're doing, it doesn't matter what you do. Because in a year time, when the next development team will have the problem, not me anymore, and they start, you know, breaking controls because they had a different understanding of things, it gets worse. So let's make sure you first get common understanding. So it's not only about the mobile controls you implement, but it's also about the processes around development. Let's make sure we first do our proper software engineers and take our work serious, take collaborating serious, take documenting serious so we know what we're doing. Nobody asks you to write a Bible, not at all. Just make sure that we understand why this code is there. And not that the code speaks for itself magically. You can always hear my voice when you read the code. No, that's not how that works. Let's make sure we first understand why that code had to be written in the first place. And once you got at that level, you're, it, will, it will vary massively in terms of what you have to do next. It really depends on what you're building and why. Hiring a software engineer? then we recommend working with G2i. G2i is the most effective way to discover talented and pre-vetted engineers for every project. G2i vets their talent pool through technical interviews and various code challenges which are graded by actual engineers, saving you time and guaranteeing you top quality through their transparent grading. They specialize in React, React Native, and Node.js. Interested in learning more? Then go to g2i.co. Yeah. And just to dive in, I know you had mentioned, um, you know, certificate pinning. I know Sven mentioned earlier web views. I just want to dive into a couple of these things just to make it clear to our listeners, you know, what these things are. So would you be able to give me a quick summary of what a web view really is and how you would actually go about securing that web view? Let me maybe please answer that one. So um, a web view is just a very simplified browser in that sense in a mobile app. So for example, you will not have your URL bar and other things like that. So it's very simplistic. And so you, you can see this a lot in those hybrid apps also that we were talking about earlier. And in order to actually secure them properly, there are a few different flags that you can make part of a web view when you're defining or when you're defining your web view in your code. 
One of the first things is, of course, disabling JavaScript, which many times, of course, will not be possible because many times you do want to um, use JavaScript. But there are a few other different things that you can do in order to harden maybe your web view. So, for example, different kind of URL handlers that you want to block, like access to the file system, for example, that is part of the sandbox. So there's still different kind of attacks where you have um, file inclusion also within the mobile app. So this was demonstrated also a while back. So you need to um, harden your web view as much as possible, which is, as I was saying, JavaScript, the URL schema that you should be blocking that you do not want. And um, also, for example, on Android, there's something called add JavaScript interface. And this is where it can become a bit dangerous because this is where you're bridging more or less your code, your Java or Kotlin code in Android with the add JavaScript interface to your web view. And if now somebody is actually man in the middle or has maybe some stored XSS already placed on the server side, then this JavaScript piece will actually be able to execute the code that is available via the add JavaScript interface. And if this is something sensitive, then it can become quite dangerous. So this is where you would need to understand what you're actually exposing via add JavaScript interface in your web view. Fantastic. Thank you for explaining the web views a little bit. So essentially, it's just a trimmed down browser sandbox that has a lot of its own issues on top of the built in browser. But are those the same kinds of issues? So like, for example, you know, if I had a vulnerability in Safari on iOS, the web views would still be impacted by that same kind of vulnerability. So for web views, it's, um, it's a bit of a complicated thing because the web view you're working with might not be the web view you think you're working with in general. The engine you're using in your browser might be is different per Android platform is different quite a bit per iOS platform for the main browser like Chrome and uh, the embedded internet application back to your Android application with your Android platform or the uh, version of Safari. And then the web view you were offered in earlier versions of Android was again quite a different thing. So they came up with a beautiful idea and I think that's actually quite brilliant to have a installable web view like the Chrome web view that you can upgrade through, uh, the, Android Play, through the Google Play Store, which helps a lot with having a more secure web view. But then again, you should wonder and maybe, okay, if you have to wonder this, let me first make that note that you might go into the wrong direction at this point in time. But the moment that you're starting running on that web view, you don't know which version is there. So you don't know which vulnerabilities you're working with in general. Of course, you can check for the version, but it will be kind of sad that if you open up your app, you're asking your customer to first upgrade your Chrome web view via Google Play Store before you can continue. I mean, I don't think that's really the way to do this. Uh, but overall, you just, are not sure what you're going to have there. And of course, many of those browser engines have a lot of uh, commodities in terms of how stuff is implemented, which will indeed affect uh, both the web view as well as the browser. So you're ending up with both things at the same time. The only difference is, of course, if you open up the browser stack and you're vulnerable at the browser level for a certain odd execution path, all you get for free is what you normally would also have in your normal browser. So that's how you would handle a mobile website. And there's no a lot of added complications in there but the moment that you're having that mobile app and you figured okay we found ways to secure our data so let's open up that web view now all of a sudden that sandbox with that secure data has opened up towards that same web view so now we increase the risk so there's two th those three things basically come to that okay so essentially you know web views are going to increase your risk but it's not exactly the same as the browser that's running on the device and it can be all kinds of different depending on which operating system you're running on on the mobile device overall just trim it down like sven told and that will really help. Exactly. Only use what you need and enable what you need rather than enabling everything and then turning things off selectively later. And then you had mentioned certificate pinning and not necessarily worrying about that out right at the start. When would you want to start to worry about that? What exactly is that going to mitigate? So I can give a very lengthy answer in that. It would tire your, uh, your listeners a lot. I gave a presentation about it that's to pin or not to pin, which was focused on iOS and one also focused on both platforms. I think it's great to include the links, but there's three things that should always come back. The first thing, if it comes to pinning is, if you look at the uh, attack scenarios you should wonder about is, okay, is my user in a network environment where this makes sense? So when we can be eavesdropped, so is he on public Wi-Fi? Do I really not trust uh, any of the cell networks in the country that my user is at? For instance, you can easily imagine that some of the more government controlled countries might have a different network layout than those who are a bit different basically like and then still you might wonder what the government can or cannot do but the moment you start worrying about those you're interesting 
you're developing a quite interesting app, I would say. The thing you should more be worried about is what is my user doing? If I have some sort of financial app and I want to secure the communications and I know my users are greedy and will start install those beautiful free apps uh, that you can sign up in iOS, as long as you click OK on the next device profile per certificate that you really need to install this app. Yeah. So for the developers not knowing what's happening right now, basically what many people do is uh, try to do is skim people into installing apps for free, like clones of those, or not even clones and even functional clones, but at least you get the idea it's for free. And you have to install a certificate with that. And that certificate can then often be used to bypass any network communications because it's uh, similar to the certificate offered by the by, by the server that's eavesdropping, basically, or that's the man in the middle. Um, at the other end, in the Netherlands, we had this beautiful story of DigiNotar, and just Google it, That's because otherwise you can rent on, on TLS insecurities in general for ages, and I don't think that's uh, the proper thing to do right now. But the nice thing is that we that basically proved that the moment the CA gets compromised, we, attackers can hand out certificates for any domain. So the moment you're really worried about your network in in terms of what you communicate with your server, if you're really worried about the protocols you've been using to authenticate and that people might reuse that material for lesser good, let's say, that's the moment you start thinking about pinning. But then there's the two other issues to think about. If you want to protect the keys that you're using via pinning and use those keys for a longer period of time, are you actually able to secure the private key of that key pair well enough at your server and as a team that you want to put all the extra effort in reusing that key for a very long time. At the other end, saying we just shift keys more often and we have a different strategy so we forget about pinning in general because it's hard to do key management or secrecy management as well, you might have different fish to fry. So it starts with, do I don't trust the network or is the risk too high? Then yes, I can start pinning on my public key But then still ask yourself, am I really able to protect the private key well enough that it makes sense to pin towards the public key? Okay, so essentially it's that, you know, risk versus reward benefit. You know, how much do I really trust the network? And as with everything in security, it eventually ties back to your threat model. Where are your trust boundaries? And, you know, when you talk about zero trust, we always say, you know, we don't trust the network until we establish trust in the network. And those other, you know, newer security approaches, but maybe from that sense of, you know, do I really need to worry about certificate pinning and add all this additional workload to the development team? You know, it really becomes that risk versus reward, or can I just, you know, rotate certificates every, you know, year or every six months instead of, you know, worrying about this very long-term public key hash pin to verify that they're using the correct certificate when connecting my application. Exactly. Of course, we can ease the pain by making sure you got the public key set up and a bunch of backup keys as well. Just make sure you don't store the private key at the same location as the other private key that might have been compromised. And yes, we've seen customers do that. So that's where you can start off with. So like your you as a mobile app developer don't have to worry, but just make sure you did communicate to your server guy um, that he shouldn't be deploying something else than the things you agreed on, because then you basically kill the app communication again. And more importantly, instead of uh, thinking about is my network secure, is thinking of is my protocol secure? And that's, of course, basically, so how long would a session last? So. If I uh, start authenticating, do I authenticate with something like secure remote password protocol where we don't send the password at all, but we send something else over the wire that the server and the client have to calculate, blah, blah, blah. Or do we um, do some sort of harder to replay mechanism where we sign off messages and so you can't uh, can't see stuff, but you can't uh, change them. That could already help a lot. But of course, if you have your standardized app with a standard uh, way of authenticating and you can easily replay those things and you're worried about that, then you should think about pinning if you know that your app is used a lot in environments where it's easy to to eavesdrop, basically. Uh, Which does combine with what's the version of the operating system you're running on. For instance, iOS got uh, ATS already in there quite a long time, so a lot of hygiene is being done by the operating system already. And with newer versions of Android, it became much harder to use custom supplied certificates uh, where instead of the operating system ones. So if you only have these guys and girls and uh, whatever with very modern devices and you based your development on that, then again, there's less worry you need to have about that. But the moment you want to support everybody, including those people with very old devices where these controls aren't there, then pinning might not be such a bad idea in general, as long as you take care of the things we just talked about. 
Maybe just one thing to add from here, Rune, is also the operational aspect. I mean, you have all the technical components that you need to implement, but you still need to be sure that the operation team that is maybe changing the certificate on your server is actually talking to the development team. Because I could see in the past a lot of clients that were quite happy to finally implement SSL pinning, and one year later, they actually had a denial of service against their user base because the certificate was updated without updating the certificate in the app. So this is also something that you really need to take care of and is quite crucial when when you're implementing SSL pinning. Okay, so it it's not just the, you know, can I develop it and put it in the app, but can I actually operate this architecture and system to support this? You know, do I have the appropriate automation in place to, you know, ensure that if a certificate gets changed on our infrastructure, I can change it on all these mobile applications and not cause a huge denial of service. So by implementing these, you know, secure network communications, does that actually help with some of the you know, conversations around spoofing cell towers on LTE with, you know, I know law enforcement uses the Stingray device, but it's been shown that you can actually do that just from, you know, your computer with some, you know, network cards. Is there any actual security benefit from that perspective by doing these types of like certificate pinning? Or is there something else you would have to do to protect against that? So it starts with certificate pinning or actually public key pinning, because like you already beautifully mentioned, they need the hashes. So you rather pin against the hash of that key than the full certificate. So we have less work of need. And it can really help because the moment uh, somebody starts uh, jumping into the network, and now there's a bit of, um, I'm not sure, is, has there been a previous episode where TCIP was covered a bit before we start talking about spanning trees and all that jazz? I think we've done a little bit of network coverage, um, but I don't think we've delved too deep into the concepts of spanning trees and, you know, remote spanning tree and the different protocols in that sense. Okay, so let's keep it simple. The moment you are in a Wi-Fi, you're sharing that with others that might be consuming the app that you're developing or that, you know, as an attacker, you're in the same space as the guy with the banking app. Just keep it simple. Then that guy with the computer in the same Wi-Fi network can start saying to all the computers, hey. The shortest path to the internet is at this address. Come along, let's celebrate. And then all the computers go like, and all the mobile devices go like, hey, okay, that's indeed a shorter amount of hubs, and that's very fast. Let's go there. So now from the sort of space where it start doing stuff like that. Now we can start seeing the lower level of communications, which is awesome or awful, depending on which side of the tree you are, of course. I mean, seriously. But in the end, where it then bounced to is what did you do at a higher level? So at the um, the TLS level, the moment you have uh, public key pinning in place, and now this computer starts offering certificates for uh, different uh, for the domain of your banking app, but it doesn't fit with what you got in your app, then you're secure. The only thing is, of course, is that this banking app no longer works. And I've been trying everything and it doesn't work. And that's just weird. So the worst case scenario is that you as a developer or as a um, bank app provider get a nasty review on Google Play like, hey, um, come on, man, my app is not even working in here. So yeah, but that's maybe not as bad as having to explain the bank why the money got lost. So in that sense, it's about it's an ongoing team during this conversation, your threat model. <laughs> and next to that, it's about, OK, so how far do you want to go? So in that sense, it does secure against these type of attacks for quite a lot. Of course, the moment you have access to the device, pinning doesn't make sense. It doesn't do anything. So the moment I can, during this network conversation, install some sort of malware or offer something else in your device that basically goes a level deeper than the current app communication, pinning doesn't help at all. But that's quite hard. So in that sense, then having pinning can help a lot. Exactly. So it's like that conversation we have on the endpoint side. Once you have administrative access or root access, it really doesn't matter what the app does to secure it. It's game over once they have the operating system. Exactly. So just changing directions a little bit, how do you see the security internals differing between you know the two major operating systems on mobile devices, iOS versus Android? You know, Is there huge differences in areas like how data is stored or how you would implement local authentication or how you would implement anti-reverse engineering or, you know, the secure network communications. I know you had mentioned a little bit about, you know, once you start getting into these more security focused things, now you're bumping your version levels up and now you're not supporting everyone. But just kind of focusing on, I guess we'll say the latest versions of these things. You know, what do you see as, you know, the big security internals in these devices and how are they beneficial to you as a developer? I would say that they are in many areas actually quite different, uh, quite quite the same. 
Meaning, um, for example, on iOS, you have your local authentication with different kind of biometrics. You also have the same thing on Android with local authentication through your iris scan, through your finger, whatever. As Jeroen was already saying, when it comes to data storage on Android, you have the key store. Um, on iOS, you have the keychain. So there are many things that nowadays are very, very similar, you could say, in terms of security. This changed over time, but I would say the major difference, and this is where it really becomes inconsistent on the Android side, is on iOS. As a developer, I can just assume that there is a secure enclave. I can use the keychain and all the different hardware things are actually available. And this is very, very different to Android because on Android, when you run, when you, when you develop an Android app, you obviously want to have a huge customer base, meaning you would actually need to go down quite a bit into the older Android versions that maybe have, that maybe cannot support all the different features or maybe do not even have all the hardware features. There are a lot of cheap Android phones, for example, for example, that do not even have a, a TEE or secure enclave, something like this. So it's not really a hardware packed key store. And in these areas, I would say it's actually the big difference in terms of security because some of the devices um, have actually a lot of limitations already in the hardware, simply because you have such a zoo of different um, vendors and, and hardware vendors. Yeah, so essentially that single source of hardware from iOS does give it that ease of development. You know, you kind of know what to expect if you're on XYZ iOS version because you know exactly what device they stop supporting that version on. Exactly, yes. And in iOS, it's just very, very easier to, to maintain because you know that these hardware features are there and they're there for all hardware devices, or for all devices. So between iOS and Android, would you say that, you know, one of them has better process isolation? So for ex if example, I'm running, you know, I downloaded a malicious app and it's running in the background and now I download your app and I start using it for, you know, making my million dollar banking transfer to my other account, you know, does one of them provide better security in that sense? So to answer that question, we have to go a bit, like trip down the memory lane because it has different quite a lot. Although I first have to make a big um, a disclaimer, I'm more of an application security specialist. Uh, if you look at the AOSP project behind Android, if you look at the amount of code that has been published till now and the amount that hasn't been in terms of how uh, iOS has been built up, there's so many things to say about that. And there's awesome presentations from specialists that are specialized in that field. Like look at Tudesco and other people, and I think you should really dive into them into that area but if we look at the application consuming part so what we can do as developers because i think that's something we can answer then there's been quite a journey for both android and ios so for instance android intents we used to start over with having everything open if you just call this intent you end up somewhere and then we ended up for instance with extra security control saying okay you can only use this uh process interpersonal communication if you are signed by the same key uh, the moment uh, you got released into the app store. So you can make sure that only certain app components can talk to each other if they're from the same vendor, for instance. At the other end, you got iOS, where they started using things like entitlements to further secure the uh, claims required to do certain inter-process communication, which helped a lot in securing that communication. But overall, of course, these are controls that are implemented on the application level and how well the boundary beyond that has been uh, secured so you really have to use these paths that has been quite different and that's harder to assess of course in terms of what's better or what's not better what we've seen so far if you look at attacks like the overlay attack for instance in android where a malicious app will then just make you think you're communicating with it but in the meantime it's just clicking through to the other application and then doing the actions it wants to um, that's been giving a lot of attention in Android, for instance, which is indeed a, has been quite a problem for a while. At the other end, if you look at the keyboard usage, for instance, uh, we saw that on Android, you had custom keyboards quite soon. So everyone was like, oh yeah, custom keyboards, bad idea. But then at some point in time, Apple opened it up as well because, hey, custom keywords are awesome because you might want to have a different way to communicate. And then people realized we're now in the same pile of trouble as we are an android in that sense and then when it comes to shared clipboards it's get a bit a bit harder because how do you want to for instance that your password uh, uh application communicate with that application you want to authenticate that because you need a way to let that communicate and if all you have left is the clipboard yeah then both platforms have the same problems so in that sense, if it comes to those share platforms that's, you know, designed to be open, we get in trouble basically on both platforms. But if it comes to the more detailed things after that, luckily there's beautiful talks by different people that are specialized in that. And it's a great thing to watch. Although as a developer, you'll learn lovely things about low-level programming. And I would really advise you to do it in general so you can 
enjoy the ease of the work we have to de- to develop our apps, basically. So do you see a benefit, you know, and you mentioned the signed apps concept, you know, is there a benefit to the iOS, you know, almost walled garden approach to the app store, whereas on Android, we're seeing, you know, more of a wild west where signed apps is kind of a optional additional feature if you'd like to use it sort of kind of whereas you know on the apple side you know you will go through our app store and you will be signed unless you know excluding the concept of a jailbreak device yeah so that's um that's an interesting thing it starts with actually let's go zoom a little bit into the walled garden because remember we started talking about bypassing the tls hygiene by installing that site loaded app so there's still a bunch of websites that offer installing side loaded app on iOS in general, as long as you allow that developer certificate to be installed or some other certificate that signed that app, and then you can still use those apps. Of course, that doesn't mean that that app all of a sudden gets control over the complete device or whatever, because you still need to assess it rights. Or yes, it might hold some other bypass that we don't know about, which will get you into trouble. But if you look at what Android is currently working with, yes, there is a much bigger amount of malware uh, statistically in Android than in iOS, for instance. So in that sense, Android has a lot more security issues. So having a walled uh, garden type of approach where you have a strict review and you can't just download anything helps indeed quite a lot. At the other end, we also see, because of that, a faith of developers into Apple will fix this. So... Why should I encrypt using Keychain? Can't I just use the shared preferences? I mean, seriously, who's jailbreaking his iPhone anyway? And then all of a sudden we forgot about things like Pokemon Go, people being too lazy to walk around with GPS or going to Japan for the final Pokemon and still wanting to obtain those and therefore jailbreak it. And just, whoop, there it is. We got the full open space and that simple site-loaded app will give you all the problems you had before. So if you're sure that your users are not one of those, and that means you need to know your users. Good luck with a multi-million user app. Yeah, sure. Then indeed you get certain guarantees because Apple looked at everything that got installed on that device. But if you don't, which is exactly the case with a multi-million user app, then the pitfall you have with this security approach is that you think Apple took care of everything for everybody and nothing will ever happen. So why should I do this additional control? Why should I encrypt something? Why should I use the keychain specifically? Because we're okay. That becomes a serious pitfall the moment you start jumping into that. Of course, if you still take security as serious as you would on, a, on an Android device, then a walled garden approach gives you a lot of benefit in terms of the actual security of the runtime that you're running on. Given the users indeed update, do their thing, play nice, don't want to sit in their uh, beautiful buttons when they play Pokemon Go, but, you know, actually do stuff the way they're supposed to. Okay, so there's benefits to the walled garden, you know, especially from a security, you know, application developer perspective, you're doing checks for, you know, a jailbroken device, you're doing checks for, you know, side-loaded applications, and, you know, detecting that these things are occurring around your app to be able to say, hold on, wait, I don't want to run on a jailbroken device because of our threat model that, you know, we don't like our financial app running on jailbroken devices. And then, of course, there's a problem with that, unfortunately. So the, the World Garden helps in the fact that if everybody plays nice, we're okay. Uh, but the moment people don't play nice, they can also try to hide the jailbreak uh, detection, of course. So they hide the jailbreak, they make it harder to detect, they do other things because they still want to play Pokemon Go without moving around. They still want to be able to use their devices they used to while having that jailbreak so as long as you can assume that it's okay uh, or i mean if you assume that people are playing by the rules then having walled garden helps but the moment you know but the moment you have a too bigger user base that can use this consumption app for virtually anything then you know that this doesn't help you for your specific app it just only helps those that really play by the rules. So for instance, if you have like a corporate device that's locked down and your corporate users only use it for business, sign off contract, blah, 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 and really play by the rules, and I haven't seen anybody who did, but let's assume that we are, then this helps. But until then, you have to do the same thing as you would do in a non-walled garden environment. Take security serious. Just make sure you implement those controls and don't think, because Apple will review your app for not making some of the mistakes, but don't think that the user might not have tricked itself into do certain things to this device that makes some of the things you thought you didn't need to implement very key to implement to prevent that data leakage. Okay, awesome. So just, again, if you're developing on the iOS side, just don't assume that Apple is fixing everything for you. You know, actually 
do it with a threat model for your application and decide what needs to be done. So now a little more into that and talking a little bit more about what you guys both do as your, you know, side project. What products have you guys created out of the OWASP mobile AppSec project? So for this one, um, we need to go back maybe a little bit, three, four years. Um, for this, I was still working as a penetration tester. And one of my colleagues who was Bernhard Müller or Ben, we were doing a lot of mobile application penetration tests, and we could see that there's actually a lot of inconsistency in mobile testing, not only from the pen tester side, but also on the developer side. So a lot of the things that we were already discussing today, there was not a really clear direction. Is SSL pinning now a vulnerability? Is do you really should disable all the things in your web view? So there were a lot of things scattered around the internet in different great blog articles in GitHub and I don't know in great books, but there was not really an industry standard in that sense. In that sense, so we had the web application testing guide from Overs that covers everything on the API, but there was nothing in terms of the of the actual endpoint in terms of the mobile client. So there was a lot of inconsistency, and we wanted to drive that change in that sense back then and to become an, an industry standard, which I can say we, we also achieved in recent years. And while we are doing this project back then, we had the mobile security testing guide, which is just a very verbose technical explanation how you can test certain aspects or certain parts of security in your mobile app. But while we were doing this, we could see that we are merging test cases we are splitting them again and we had a lot of inconsistency while we were writing this and then we were actually creating the MASVS which is the mobile application security verification standard very clunky very long word so it's the MASVS and this we were focusing first back then it was like three and a half years back in order to get all the different requirements i mean we were um, emphasizing and describing now already quite a lot about them about data storage about the network communication ssl pinning web view and so on and we were grouping all of these requirements together as part of the masvs so these are requirements that are os agnostic and this became now our our baseline you could say and these are roughly 80 requirements at the moment. And once we had these requirements, we could actually start with the mobile security testing guide. So these are the main two projects that um, Hirun and myself and also others are working on. So we have the MASVS that is summarizing all the different requirements, security requirements specifically for mobile apps. We have the mobile security testing guide that is outlining these different requirements into technical test cases. And then we have the Excel sheet that is trying to bridge these things so that we have a link from the MASVS to the MSTG. And on top of that, created a few other things. Um, we created the OVASP CrackMes. These are different mobile apps for iOS and um, for Android, where people can really get their hands dirty and try to hack those apps. Then we have the hacking playground that we created, which so the, the correct me are more for reverse engineering, bypassing different client-side security controls. Then we have the hacking playground, which is again something where you can try to get your hands dirty again with the different test cases. And I think last year, Hirun was also starting a side project in order to map the Xamarine, Google Flutter, and all of these different things from the MASVS into these hybrid frameworks because they are a bit different. I guess we can also put this into the show list so that people can also get uh, an idea of that. This is, this is still work in progress, but this is why we also want to map this not only to native apps, but also to these um, hybrid frameworks. So essentially you have, you know, the verification standard is kind of the overall, you know, that's where I think, you know, as Herna mentioned, the leveling, you know, the different levels of, that you would pick based on your threat model. And then you take the mobile security testing guide to actually test and verify that you're meeting those standards. And then I think there's also a checklist that you can use to ensure that you're meeting the MASVS requirements. Exactly. Maybe to quickly elaborate, because I was not mentioning that for the MASVS, you were just mentioning the different levels. So in the MASVS, we have this, we have the level ones, and these are baseline security requirements. This means every app should have the security requirements built in. And on top of that, and this is now again where we come to the threat model, if you have specific threats, then there's the level two, this might be SSL pinning, and then we have another category, with a, which is resiliency against reverse engineering. So these are your root detection, jailbreak detection, all of these things. I'll have links to all of those things in the show notes. Um, Hern, can you actually talk a little bit more about the um, project that you're working on, on mapping the standard over to those hybrid apps? 
So over uh, the last one and a half years, we got many requests from people like, hey, how do I do this in the Xamarin app? How does it work in Apache Cordova? And then funny enough, we actually see a growing Flutter base as well where the same questions are being asked. So given that we're not hybrid specialists, because that means you have to dive into that stack very deeply and then understand it, what happens, how does it get cross-compiled, what runs where, uh, I, I basically gave a shout out to the community like, hey, what we're going to do is the following. If you think this is important, spend some time with us. Here are the Google Drive sheets and update those. Some of them are still quite empty, which shows that there haven't been enough interest from the security community, at least to uh, give traction. So I hope, well, let me just use five seconds of your time. Dear listener, if you are a security expert, please go to the show notes and check those Google Sheets. And if you really want to help your hybrid developing colleagues, start filling them in. We would love you to help us out. Thank you very much. I will definitely include a link to those in the show notes. I also wanted to dive a little bit into the hacking playground. Is there, you know, any way that a developer could leverage that to, you know, help them understand, you know, the verification standard or what a pen tester is going to be looking for based on the testing guide and, you know, understanding, you know, this kind of code is bad, this kind of code is good, and this kind of code could go either way. And this is how I would test for that. Yeah, this is exactly the intention. I mean, when we were starting with this whole project four years back, um, the hacking playground was just more or less the output of our research research in order to demonstrate how bad code actually looks like, <laughs> so that pen testers, of course, know how it um, how it should how it shouldn't look like. And um, in the MSTG, we are bridging that actually usually in the in the static analysis section. So in the MSTG, we always have the same structure. We have an overview where we just explain what this test case is actually all about. Then we have the static analysis, where we're actually making a deep dive into um, the different keywords that you should be looking for as a pen tester. But we also give a best practice usually for the developers what you should do in order to mitigate the findings. And then there's the um, dynamic analysis part, meaning what you as a pen tester can do to analyze an app while the app is running. So the hacking playground was just more or less the the, um, things that you can use as a developer or maybe also for security trainings to really illustrate how you can easily hack something and just to demonstrate all the bad practices that you shouldn't do so that a developer can just get the IPA or the APK, can install it, play around with it. The source code is available on GitHub, obviously, so they can just change it in whatever way they want, maybe even fix the issues and see if the fix actually works or if there's still some way to bypass it. So it was just to get a kickstart for for people to, to get them started and play around with it. Awesome. So it's similar to almost in the web side, you know, web goat or, you know, the OWASP do shop, you know, hacking examples, you know, that way you can see, you know, this is what bad code looks like. This is what good code looks like. This is how you'd fix it. And then from a security training side, you can even take that and sit with the developer and say, Hey, like, let's go through this code and see what's wrong with it. Why it's wrong. What would be broken? And then in that developer's head, they can then kind of draw that line and go, you know, I used that function last week when I was writing some code, maybe I shouldn't have done that that way. Exactly, exactly. And on top of that, we also have the crack me's that, that just purely focus on reverse engineering. So for the crack me's, which are part of the MSTG project, we also have a very good uh, write-ups because a lot of great people were um, solving them and were writing those write-ups into their blog posts. So even though that reverse engineering is usually not a skill set of developers, but if you want to dive deeper into this, you can also just go to our crack me page and go through the different blog posts because they explain it really in a lot of detail how they were using different kind of tools like Ida or Ghidra or whatever in order to break those tools. And of course, Frida, which is one of the favorite tools for reverse engineers nowadays. Awesome. So essentially, you know, that may not necessarily be something that a developer is going to do out of the box, but at least being able to go through these walkthroughs and say, oh, wow, it really is that easy to reverse engineer these applications. Maybe I shouldn't stick the secret in my, uh, you know, shared config space or in a plain text config file sitting in the application folder. Yeah, exactly. There should be a lot of aha moments. (laughs) So just changing directions a little bit. We have the testing guide. We have, you know, the verification standard. You know, theoretically, a developer is going to sit there or, you know, a development manager or a project manager is going to sit with the security team and they're going to say, all right, so based on the threat model that we've created as a group, you know, we've agreed that this project is going to have this verification level, you know, it's going to be a level two and we need to implement anti-reverse engineering and 
you know, we're going to take these things and we're going to take all these standards and say, let's verify against this. How would I take those and now actually integrate that into my project? Is that something that, you know, I'm going to stick in my CI CD pipeline? Is that something where, you know, it's going to be manual verification with the checklist and just going through and saying, yes, we've done this. Yes, we've done this. Yes, we've done this. So that really depends on the controls that you're implementing. So let's, let's go a little bit back. Let's again take the TLS uh, configuration as a starting point. So it's relatively easy to take your application in, a, in its runtime if you want to, or just the client with which you're connecting to and try to create an integration test where you basically offer something else that it should have been connecting to and see if it breaks. So for a lot of things, it's easier to develop your own tests. And it goes actually back to why should I do that? The moment you get your own tests that you can run on every change to see if you didn't break the security controls, it's the best thing you can do because the faster the feedback you get, the better it is because the less time you're spending on other things. And that comes together with the fact that the moment you are writing tests for it as a developer, you start to really understand what's happening because... It might well be possibly while listening to this podcast that you've been assuming that TLS works in a certain way and that you did a great job on the configuration or that you did something completely wrong. But while you're writing the test, you might find out something completely different because now you have to ask yourself, what should have happened? What should have been the end game if I set this up this way? And by writing your own tests, that is, if you have the time and budget for it, of course, it becomes A, much easier to understand what you're doing and B, it becomes much stronger to uh, make sure that you don't, well, get into a messy situation later point in time. If you go one level further away, you get stuff like the BDD mobile security like Davide Shioka created, which is an open source testing framework for uh, based on the MSCG, which is beautiful because then you let an external testing suite uh, check whether you implemented certain controls correctly, which means you get a little bit of less understanding, or at least you need to spend less time on that. And you can really focus yourself on getting that business value out instead of the security value part. Um, and then one level further away is just using more of a commercial suite that you don't need to tailor, but does some of the control testing. And then you have to make sure that it's okay, because you're not really sure. Uh, but it's some for some, it's quite well. For some controls, it's quite effective. But so for some controls, it'll be fine, quite hard. So if you want to make sure, for instance, that you didn't store something with a wrong write on your application, it's very easy to have a scanner checking if you did something to the SD card or the public document directory in terms of secure storage validation, for instance. But if you want to validate whether you did your obfuscation correctly, that's going to be quite tricky because every time you obfuscate or deobfuscate, I hope you have a different path. Because if not, you're not obfuscating correctly, um, which means that now all of a sudden you have to start creating um, a very odd testing suite or just have more of a manual verification to see what's happening. Because testing these type of things will be way harder, of course. So first of all, it depends on how much you want to learn, how much you want to make sure you can get feedback ASAP, whether you broke the control with some of your changes. And uh, letter, of course, is the type of control you're verifying. So whether it's an L2, more difficult requirement, or an enter reverse engineer requirement. Kind of going back to the start of your discussion, you know, by building tests, I have to actually understand the underlying protocols of what's happening, not just benefit from the abstraction and walk away and say, well, it was Apple's problem to implement TLS correctly, not mine. I don't care about what the config is, not my problem. All right. And just one last thing before we you know, start to wrap up the show. Is there any benefit to taking, you know, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, you know, you know, you have your project management team and all that kind of stuff where they're, you know, going to look at something like MASVS and, you know, decide what level we really sit at, you know, with the security team and deciding, you know, what's our threat model, that kind of stuff. Is it something that you would want to leverage in your early architecture phase? Like, how could I leverage these things in an early architecture phase? You know, when we look at like more formal things like, you know, SABSA or TOGAF or, you know, a less formal model, like you know, I draw my UML diagrams and that's our app architecture. Have a nice day. How could I leverage these tools to help improve the security from an architecture perspective moving into a development? I mean, usually it really makes the most sense if you already use whatever the developers are using. So when you're just creating your different use cases, then from a security point of view, you, of course, just want to 
think malicious and make them abuse cases. So meaning you really start very, very early and just try what can actually go wrong, what can go wrong with the confidentiality, with the integrity, with the availability of all the of all the data, of the network communication, what goes wrong if this goes down. And um, you really want to break this use cases into abuse cases. And this is where the MESVS can actually help you. And this is where we can where we are coming back to the threat modeling. And what you actually do is you make different kind of threat modelings dependent on your on your different use cases to see what is actually um, working or not working. Awesome. So, you know, you're leveraging the standards to almost help guide you from a security perspective to say, here are the abuse cases, or even as a developer, if you want to try to get ahead of the curve to say, you know, okay, well, these are the things that security is going to look for. So let's think about you know, how we're going to want to implement these, how we're going to want to implement it into our project management cycle, be it agile, waterfall, what have you, you know, and creating those use cases or abuse cases and, you know, integrating it into the actual project design and the architecture design. Exactly. I mean, the, the thing is that as a developer, you most likely will not be aware of all these different um, attacks and requirements, but this is exactly where the MASVS comes into the picture. I mean, I'm not saying you should not read everything end to end, but if you have these kind of use cases and you're trying to think in, and, and put your hacker hat on, maybe let's phrase it like this, and then the MASVS can definitely help you guide through. And this is where the levels also come in place. First, focus on level one. Then on level two, if you really have everything done and you're paranoid enough, then go for the resiliency and the reverse engineering controls. Fantastic. Just to wrap up the show, and I'll ask both of you this question, starting with Varun. Is there anything that I didn't cover that I missed that you think a developer or a software engineer should know? Thinking about it a bit of it, because it's been a wonderful show so far. Thank you very much. Now, I think you cover the most important topics so like web view storage uh network security um how to use the tooling i think those are all uh, very important one thing that we always you know talked around a little bit of course is authentication authorization of course not related strictly to mobile but i think that's one final pitfall to always uh remember an app developer about the moment that you start talking to an api there's no difference between web and mobile that you have to make sure that nobody can read the messages of somebody else unless you really has to <laughs> so that doesn't change when you do mobile i think that's the only thing we missed other than that great yeah i think we covered everything that's of importance yeah, and I'd refer developers back. I know a lot of things are moving towards, you know, the OAuth standard of authentication on the API side and stuff like that. We did an episode which had a lot more detailed discussion on it, episode 376. And we've also done an episode previously. I believe it is 383 with Neil Madden on securing your API, uh, where we discussed a lot more of those web security discussions around APIs and what kinds of vulnerabilities existed and how you'd mitigate it. And Sven, same question for you. You know, is there anything that I missed or that Hearn didn't mention that you would want a software engineer to come away with, you know, after listening to this episode? I think we actually really touched almost all different areas. So I think that was a quite packed show. I guess the only thing that I would like to add is that in terms of tooling, in terms of security tooling that can actually help you, I would say it's quite limited and there's not really... So what I mean by that is... It's just very, very diverse. As we could already hear at the beginning of the show, we have progressive web apps, we have native apps, we have hybrid apps. There's just so many different kind of apps. And then on top of that, we have so many different frameworks. We have React, we have Cordova, we have Xamarin. And having now different kind of security testing tools, of course, is quite hard, especially if you have a big enterprise and you have a lot of different diverse um, frameworks, then the tooling in that sense might be quite limited when it comes, for example, to source code review. So I think the most effective way in order to really build security in the start early, start with threat modeling and really identify what you want to focus on. And this is where you can really leverage on a lot. Fantastic. Thank you. I just want to thank both of you for coming on the show and you know discussing mobile application security and all different kinds of issues and how we can leverage you know different testing, tooling, and you know, integrate it into the development lifecycle. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to be here and an honor. Have a lovely show and thank you for listening. Thanks for inviting us. It was really great to be on the show, Justin. Thanks for that. Yeah, of course. This is Justin Beyer for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. 
To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.